bless you, Ron. Appreciate it. Thank you and your family. You bet. You bet. Hey, we'll give them a round of applause again for the work that they're doing. Yeah, I'll take that one. We'll kind of wind around each other here real quick. Got to love technology and all the cords that it brings, too. Um, anyway, well, what time do we have? we got a few minutes. Go ahead and open your Bibles, if you would, to, to Philippians chapter 4. We've been continuing in our study of Philippians, and um, once we hit chapter 3, and looking at chapter 3 and chapter 4, I wanted to remind you on a weekly basis that we are in a battle between the spirit and the flesh that, that fights and wars in our midst, inside of us, causing us to often not do what we want to do, <laughs> whether it's in the flesh or in the spirit, uh, wanting to desire to do something the spirit would lay on our hearts, but then our flesh just being lazy and telling us things that would cause us to not do what So there's a war, right? This last week, my wife and I found a different war, a viral war. <laughs> uh, viruses going throughout our family be praying for us. We'd love to get better and feeling better. The girls are all had it really bad, and that's why they aren't here today. Um, but there's this war going on inside of us, and as we were looking in, in, in Philippians 3 and 4, I just wanted to remind you of some spiritual principles that come up in these chapters that would challenge you and me uh, to live in such a way that we engage this battle with the flesh... And we find victory. We find ways to win. Not just being people in the church that are hum and glum and, oh, I can't do anything and things are spiraling out of control. But no, but that we've been receiving receivers of a spirit of power, of love and of sound mind that, that we would be, we'd know uh, the words that these apostles were writing to each other and saying, yes, you can be victorious. You can live a life of impact, of influence that can make it beyond the flesh, even though we're still in the flesh. So the challenge here, as we we're looking over these chapters, is there's some spiritual principles that we've been looking at. We looked at worship the first week, sacrifice, talked a couple weeks ago about faith and what that looks like, and we'll talk some about that again today. Handling conflict last week, because the flesh wants to take every moment and opportunity that it can to expose areas like conflict and, and try to wreck and ruin the work of God. But I hope that was a challenge for you last week. Actually, really paid off in my week this last week in talking with some believers from out of James 5. I remember talking about restoring a brother, and I got a couple of opportunities to minister to some guys that were falling away. And how glorious that was and encouraging it was to hear the words of God come to life in my week. So I hope that was the same for you. Today we're going to talk about winning the battle with the flesh through a thing called prayer. And we, we, we went over these verses just a little bit last week, but I really want to take and, and really expound on the power that Paul is talking about in just a few verses, some very familiar verses that you and I know out of Philippians 4. But let's go ahead and look at those verses real quick, and then we'll d begin to talk about what this prayer life looks like. So uh, check out, if you would, let's start back in verse 4 of chapter 4, and we'll continue on to verse 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which pass, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, and whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure and whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and any, or if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. It's quite a list of things here to look at, but there's some very specific promises that come out of a prayer life found biblically rooted in the Word of God. 
Okay? We're going to talk about some of these things as quickly as I can. And this is probably going to be more teaching than preaching because we've got a lot to cover in a little time. I encourage you to take notes if you can, but there are notes provided in your bulletin, so go ahead and look at those. The, the first thing Paul says here at the very beginning in verse 6, the challenge he gave them was to first off be anxious for nothing. And and he, he's in effect saying here, I want you, before you pray, the first thing to do, we're going to talk about four steps that really come out of this, that really give us a victorious prayer life. And the first thing he calls us to do is to redirect our thoughts. He even says it a little bit later in verses 8 and 9, talking about the things that we should be thinking about. But he begins verse 6 by saying, I want you to take a moment and realize that you shouldn't be anxious for anything. This is a command to control your mind and not to worry. Uh, Graham read out of Matthew 6, where Jesus commands multiple times in that chapter, Do not worry. Don't worry. Jesus' command. And you can see in some of these things, in redirecting our minds, the commands that come out of Scripture, Isaiah 26, 3, you and I know that He keeps those in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on Him, the Lord, because we trust in Him. Colossians 3, 1 through 4, set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. Romans 12, 2 reminds us to renew our mind. This is part of worship. He says the spiritual act of worship, laying your life on the altar. But then he continues and he says to renew your mind. Test and prove what God's will is, that good and perfect will. So the command to renew our minds. Philippians 4, we just read that, that, that think of these things. Romans 8, 6. The mind that is set on the spirit is life, but the carnal mind is death. I want you to realize and see that the prayer life that starts with worry is not a victorious prayer life at all. It's a prayer life that does not think of the things of God, therefore it cannot yield the things of God. Does that make sense? When we go to the Lord in prayer, uh, constantly in this mind of worry... Our requests become on our stuff and our baggage and our issues, and we don't ever get to experience the, the, the peace and the, the surpassing, the understanding of the will of God when we come with a prayerful mind that's set on worry. So I think Paul starts here and saying, when you pray, first deal with your mind. And, and when we talk about this, I think that understanding the position of prayer is important. I, I love this. this uh, David Guzecki, the commentator uh, that I, I read up on, there's a good, if you're interested in good commentators, I can give you some good resources. He's one of them that I read up on a lot. And he mentioned this, to be anxious for nothing and to pray. This is a command, not an option. Undue care is an intrusion into the arena that belongs to God alone. It makes us the father of the household instead of the child. I think oftentimes when we come into the arena of prayer, we come with our agenda, come with our worries, we come with our cares. Not that we we're supposed to cast us on the Lord, but in the very moment, at the very beginning, when we start praying, I think it's important that we put this step in our lives where we deal with the worry. Once and for all, before we start praying, we deal with the fact that positionally, I am a child. I think a leader that we have in power right now said that is above my pay grade at one time. And so often you and I, we, we tend to hold our fists so tight around the worries and issues that we have and taking them to the Lord that we are not dealing correctly with the position that we come in prayer. We come as a child. We don't come as the, the, the dictating, denoting father that we tend to make ourselves out to be. So when we talk about redirecting our thoughts, the importance of, of dealing with worry even before we pray, I want you to see that the way we deal with this 
I mentioned, I added this, is positional worship. Again, uh, Jesus said it very clearly in Matthew 6, 5 through 13, talking about the Lord's Prayer. He began that Lord's Prayer with what? What did he say? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You know how Jesus started prayer, it modeled for us to start with prayer? He modeled to start with worship. Why? Because he put God in the place of Father there. Do you catch that? Do you see? He understood positionally how he can come to the Father by prayer. It's not that I come worrying because I'm in control. It's saying that God, no, you are in control. That's what worship does. I hope that's what worship is designed to do for us, is to come and behold the one who's in control and worthy and holy and just and right and true. So how do we get our minds focused? Well, for for King Saul, it was for David to start playing harp. For, For this church, remember, Paul has mentioned eight times, rejoice, it's a choice. Rejoice. The idea and the understanding that to get our minds in a place where we can really commune with and really communicate with the very God of this universe begins, as Jesus even said there at the beginning of his prayer, with worship. And it's positional, knowing who's who. I'm the child. He's the father. You'll see in other epistles like 1 Thessalonians, when Paul writes to some other people, he says a very similar thing. He begins by saying in these last kind of little snippets that he ends, uh, things that he wants to tell the church to kind of end on a note where they would remember some very practical teachings. He just says in the, for the first le- uh, to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, Rejoice always! Pray without ceasing! In everything give thanks! You want to know what the will of God is for your life? It's these three things. That's what it says. Rejoice. Pray. Give thanks. This is the will of God for you. He's going to figure out everything else. Isn't that great? What a blessing. But it has to begin with you and I coming in the arena of prayer, coming to the Lord in prayer by dealing with the worry first and worshiping the Lord. I think powerful prayer happens out of worship. They're not two separate things. They work together. Powerful prayer that is effective and it works is confident because it is found first in worship. Okay? So a powerful prayer life, I think, is going to hinge on that. that We deal with the worry first. Don't be anxious. It's a command. Don't be anxious. What do I need to do? I'm so anxious, but I need to pray. But I'm so anxious, but I need to pray. Worship. Take a moment. Get your heart in the right place. Understand what position you play in this. The next thing I want you to see is to pray continually. Pray continually. It continues on and it says there in verse 6 again. But in everything by prayer and supplication. And I want to emphasize the word everything. Again, 1 Thessalonians 5 said pray continually. Paul says to the Thessalonian church. Jesus taught that in Luke 18 that he taught a parable uh, teaching men to pray always and never lose heart. So Jesus would be teaching his disciples, you need to be praying constantly, continually about everything. Guess what? The word in Greek for everything means everything, right? Okay? It's not that hard. Everything. You have not because you ask not. James reminds us. I think it's important that we realize that our prayer life being continual, I, and, and, you know, how do you do that? Sometimes that we've read that before. And Jim, how do, you, how do you have a continual prayer life? Well, be a parent, I guess. Goodness gracious. You want to, want to learn about praying continually. Lord, pray that don't bonk your head. Oh, my goodness. Pray that they don't get into that. Pray that, oh, my, you know, goodness gracious, Lord Jesus. Come. Come quickly, Lord. Um. Uh, but I think there's some truth to that. You live a life dependent on the Lord. You'll pray continually. Some of us are too dependent on ourselves. Some of us have found our little bubble, our little niche. This is how life goes according to my schedule and my things and my stuff. And you know what? Jesus would call out his disciples and call out people and say, you know what? Go to a place. Get to a place where you've got to be dependent on me. Get to a place where you have to sell it all. Get to a place where you have to do some of those things. Not that you, not that God's saying if you don't do this, you're not mine or anything. No, 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 no. 
But understand, if you want to learn what it means to have a powerful prayer life, if you want to learn what it means to really defeat the flesh, if you want to win this battle of life, try some of these things. You want to get out there and pray continually? Give up some of these things in your life. Get in a place where you need Him. So He says everything. And we were in, last Sunday night, we were in, in this, this study um, in, in our small group, and, and some things had, had come up among the group, and we were talking. And I just remember just this, this passage coming through my mind out of our group, and we were just talking about little things like parking spots and things. You know what? It says pray about everything. Why not try it? Why would, Jesus, why would Jesus say pray always? Why would Paul say pray about everything? Our life should be a continual prayer, I think. And that every moment... And the great thing is, is that in this very general sense of praying, you know, we don't always know the will of God in the moments of prayer, you know, even about praying about everything. Lord, do something with this, Lord. If it is as small as a parking spot or trying to, you know, fix your dog's health, I don't know what it is, but pray about everything. And you know what? If you don't necessarily know, hey, at least lift it before the Lord and say, you know what? God, it's yours. Your will be done. That's what Jesus continued saying. You know what? Your kingdom come, your will be done. That was the next thing he said in that prayer. I'm just going to lift it up. I'm going to pray about it. The Lord, your will be done. And I think that's important that we pray continually, knowing that God's will will be done. If it's not the front stall in the parking lot, maybe you need to park way back there because you need the exercise. I don't know. Maybe you, God knows better than you. But know that as you pray about everything, that you're doing the command, really not just of Paul, but the Lord Jesus in eight, uh, Luke 18, that you would pray always, pray all the time, not lose heart. Know that he's in control, and as you communicate with him, you develop a relationship that's a powerful thing, because you learn what the prayers of God look like, and the prayers in the heart of the Lord is. So pray continually. I think that's the challenge. So, so we're, we're supposed to deal with worry. Get rid of the worry. Understand positionally you're the child, not the father of this situation, of this life. And learn what it means to pray continually. I think it's been said well, practicing the presence of God, knowing that He's around you at all times and, and in all things, and that as you're lifting your concerns and your cares and your thoughts before the Lord, it's really a mindset more so than a, than a, a, a Heavenly Father and this Amen, you know, whatever. It's more of a mindset of being able to say, Lord, this is on my heart, and that's on my heart, and God, my mind is full of this, and practicing the presence of God. So pray continually. I think that's, that's a powerful thing. Get to a place where you have to pray continually. That's a powerful thing. You want to see answered prayer in your life? and You want to see powerful prayer? Get to a place where you have to pray all the time. The next thing I want you to see in this is pray specifically with faith. It says there back in verse 6. Every taking everything, but in everything prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. But supplication, there's a word. He, he uses the word prayer, but then he also says supplication. There's two different things and ideas that he wants to get across. He says prayer, pray about everything. Very general is, is the idea he's getting across. Just pray about things, but bring supplications and requests as well. Now supplications here specifically are specific things. Specific requests. There are general prayers, but they're very specific prayers. You understand this, I know, because if you've been around the church or prayed very long, there are very specific things. Lord, would you intervene in this situation or be there, Lord, in the midst? Lord, <laughs> there's a payment due. <laughs> there, or I've got a kid that needs you know, to get through college, and Lord, provide. They're very general prayers. They're very specific prayers. And I think it's important to pray specifically because he's saying here, Paul's saying, bring your supplications, your requests to the Lord as well. But praying with faith. Remember, we talked about faith. You know, it's hard, isn't it? You, you, you probably agree with me that when you walk into a hospital room, you see somebody dying or you see somebody that's very sick. And I want to just go ahead and it, the, the, the flesh is warring inside of me. Do I pray for this person to be healed? 
Is that the will of God in this? Do I say anything? I don't know what the will of God is. I don't want to say anything. I go, oh, you know, I, you know, Lord, just be among us. You know, Lord, you know, very general. You know, when we cannot pray in faith, it's important to pray generally. When we can pray in faith, it's important to pray in faith and to bring your supplications before the Lord. Remember, faith, what comes by hearing the word? James, if you check out James 5, 13 through 20, it would be important for us to know, because a lot of faith, word of faith teachers will take you, a lot of people in very, very charismatic, you know, just blab it and grab it, name it, claim it kind of theology, they will tell you out of James 5, they'll read that, and you know what, Elijah was just a man, you know, and, and Elijah just all of a sudden he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and finally he just, you know, God got tired of him and said, here, have your stuff, you know, kind of thing, right? <laughs> That's kind of how it seems and it sounds. That's not how it works. Because if you would know the context of what happened with what James is talking about in, in James 5, that there was this man, we talked about this last week, is why I just don't want to talk about it too long. We don't have to go to James 5, but remember, it, it mentions a powerful and effective prayer, and it talked about Elijah who prayed and he prayed and he prayed, and he didn't see the cloud coming. He was praying for you know, uh, rain. That, that was when he wanted rain. He actually prayed for the heavens to be shut up first. And he kept praying, he kept praying, and God gave him a very specific prayer, but God gave him his request. But Elijah knew Leviticus 26. This is why he could pray in faith. He knew the word. Leviticus 26 says specifically that any nation that does not follow the Lord is going to experience the heavens to be shut up. They're going to experience famine and drought. They're going to experience the pestilences that came upon Ahab's reign during that time. So, so when Elijah went to Ahab, and it says there that he brought his word, not the word of the Lord, but Elijah brought his word to Ahab saying, Ahab, for lack of a better way, put, get your act straight or famine's coming on the land. When, when, when it says there specifically in the scripture that it was his word, it really wasn't his. It was actually God's word because he was, he was bringing a request. He was telling the king exactly what was going to happen in the word of God. You get what I'm saying? Pray in the word. Pray in the word. If you have a specific request, don't pray it until you have the faith for it. And that faith comes by hearing the word of God. Does that make sense? If you can't attach scripture to that prayer, don't pray it. Pray generally. You can pray generally. But you don't know the will of God unless you have the word of God. In that prayer. I hope this is making sense. Because this is powerful. I I want you to get this. Understand this. Really know. That there's substance to prayer. There's really something to prayer. When we have the word of God involved. I know I can pray for you. And I know God's going to meet all your needs. According to his riches and glory. Because that's what it says in Philippians 4. And I know that. Whenever I. And you had that confidence. Talking about your, your child. Looking to college. Uh, uh, your, your daughter and son-in-law. It's, we know we can have that confidence because the word of the Lord says that he's going to provide all our needs. So I know, as I pray, Lord, send money to, to, to this child. I know I can pray the word of God into that situation. That's faith. That's true faith because God's word is true. And it won't go, he won't go back on it. Okay? That's faith. Praying in faith. But going outside of this, you're not guaranteed that you're going to get your request. You're Ducati and, you know, fancy, you know, high rise apartment in the sky and, you know, all the crazy things that we can try to conjure up. Because it says in James 4, as you remember, you have not because you ask not. But then you don't have because you also ask and miss that you want to spend all this stuff on yourself. So prayer specifically with faith is powerful. So get in the word. How do you pray specifically with faith? Get in the Word. How do we do this? Know the Word. And and attach that. Attach that to your prayer. I think that's so key. And in fact, it's important to pray Scripture, I think. There's one guy that I met in college, and probably one of the most powerful prayers I had ever met. He'd always calm my spirit every time I just sat and prayed with him. He'd pray forever. He'd take a long time praying. But it didn't matter. He was one of those, you know, guys that starts a, a meal with a 20-minute prayer and everything's cold, you know, kind of thing. And I'm like, ah, but it didn't matter. It just didn't matter. We enjoyed it. 
Because he'd take, man, he'd go through a psalm, and he'd just pray through a psalm, and he'd insert a word, you know, like, okay, I pray this for so-and-so, and he'd, you know, he'd pray through the word. And I tell you what, faith came in that situation, in that moment. Faith came because the word was involved. So I hope that you, in your prayer life, start adapting the word of God. Don't just throw up Hail Marys. Oh, Lord, I hope this works. Pray the word, and you'll know it'll work. That's a powerful prayer. So pray generally when you don't know the will of God, but pray all the time generally. It's important. Leave it to the Lord so that gets it off your mind. But man, when you can pray specifically, don't. Don't stop. You have not because you asked not. You know it. It's there. Take it before the Lord. So pray specifically with faith. The last thing that we need to talk about today is to pray thankfully. Back in verse 6, he says to make everything, pray about everything by prayer and supplication, general and specific prayers, with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. When was the last time you prayed with thanksgiving? Boy, that's convicting. (sighs) Maybe around November last year. (laughs) Pray thankfully. You know, and, and as I'm looking at this and I'm wrestling with the Scripture, because I even know in my heart and in my life it's not easy to pray thankfully. It's not easy to get, Lord, you are good, and I'm confident in this prayer, and God, you're going to answer, and you're going to be there, and you're in control. And I, That's not easy. Boy, it's not easy. But, but how do we do this type of prayer? How do we pray thankfully? I think it's important, and I think out of ignorance a lot of times we don't pray thankfully. I think we pray thankfully when we know the process of prayer. And and just in a brief way, in in a layman's sort of way that I can put it, I I want you to see this. And and there's probably even way more neater, cooler, more awesome things that happen in the midst of a prayer. But I want you to catch this stuff that we have scripturally that tells us what really happens when we pray. First off, we know that we pray in Jesus' name, and that lets us be heard by the Father. I think this is so interesting. I mean, Jesus died for you on the cross for so many things. I mean, to be an atoning sacrifice, so it didn't demand your life, literally your blood. Right? Uh, he died so that you'd have eternal life. He died so that he could provide things, so that you'd have access to the, to the throne room, which we'll talk about. He provided so many things. Victory over the enemy. Uh, he, he provided so much on the cross. And one specific thing that he did was that he allowed there to be a way that you and I, in the name of Jesus, could actually get into the throne room of God. Because without it, we couldn't. Without the name, without what Jesus did on the cross for us, there would be a gap so wide you and I could not, we could not get into a perfect throne room, folks. I could go through a teaching right now on the temple and how we would actually get before the Lord. It's His thing. Uh, we can't tell God how to do stuff. He, he says this is how to do it. Okay? And, and He set that. He set that way and the way that things happen in the temple. And that there would be a high priest and that we would take, you know, all, all the stuff, our junk and our sacrifices and all that stuff, our requests, and then he would intercede. But praise the Lord, Jesus took out the middleman. Sorry, Catholic Church, but we don't have to go to anybody else but right to the throne room in the name of Christ. That's what Jesus provided, and that's what he said in John sixteen twenty three through 24, that if you come to, to me in my name... And I come to the Lord Father in my name. And he's saying this specifically. We talked about this in a, in a Bible study here a few weeks ago. He was telling the disciples there, that you're not going to have me very long. I'm going to go to the Father here pretty soon. It was easy to, to kind of hear the heart of God and to actually commune with, with, with God. Well, I'm here because I'm here among you, 12, right? I'm here. You could talk to me. Just talk to me, and that's the prayer, you know? But Jesus says there in John 16, there's going to be a time where I'm going to leave, and it's going to be better for you. And the great thing is, the reason why it's going to be better, you get this, the reason why it's going to be better is because Jesus could only be in one place at one time. He, he, he was God, yeah, he was able to do anything, sure, but he decided to, remember, empty himself, we talked about, to, to be confined 
for a moment, for a time, under our laws and rules and regulations and, and all that. See, he, he wanted to do that. And then it, so he said, you know, it's going to be better that I go so the Spirit can come. So that he can indwell everyone that believes in me and can, can, can commune with the Father. And then we'll talk about in the, in the process how he works. So Jesus said there in John 16, just out of that passage, he says, I'm going to go to the Father and you're going to pray in my name. And you're going to have access to the throne room of God. I tell you, if there's, if there's confidence that should come out of the process of prayer, it's that. That Jesus died for you, so much loved you so much that he wanted to give you a voice in heaven. It's a great thing. We should have confidence in prayer. Whenever we pray in the name of Jesus, we know that he hears us, it says in, in 1 John 5. The Holy Spirit is our wise and indwelling intercessor. Filter, I like that. Aligning our requests to God's will. Romans 8, 26. We know that we have, even when we don't know what to pray, it says in, in Romans 8, we have the Spirit in us, interceding for us. And it says there in verse 27, bringing things into alignment with the will of God. So it's good to know that when we throw those general prayers in God's direction, we don't know necessarily what to pray. We can just say, God, I don't know. I don't. But I know you do. I don't know what your will is. I don't. But I know you do. And the spirit inside of us literally is hearing those things. And he's taking a package, if, if, if you will. And he's putting it. And he's filtering it. And he's saying... This is the will of God. I'm going to send that to heaven. I'm going to send that. that, that that's, that's the prayer. That's the prayer that's on God's heart. I'm going to send that. You get that? Isn't that cool? Isn't that great to know? That even when we ask for stupid stuff, right? You know, I mean, the things that are not good for us, and we look back and we're like, boy, I'm glad I didn't get that prayer answered. And man, that didn't make sense. What was I thinking? You know, and the Spirit is in us filtering those things and bringing it in alignment, Romans 8, 27, with the will of God. It's great. Jesus is our high priest. He receives the prayer. The Spirit is interceding, bringing it to the throne room. Just like, you know, if, if, if lack of a better way to put it, when you went in front of a king, you just throw yourself down in front of him and say, hey, you know, I, you know I, I, the Spirit's doing that intercessory work. Jesus at the right hand, leaning over the Father. I died on the cross for this. They're coming in my name. This is, this is your will. It's been filtered by the Spirit. This is something that needs to happen on earth. So Jesus receives our prayers in the Spirit and leads or pleads on our behalf in God's presence. You can find those, those scriptures there. Romans 8 mentions it also, but Hebrews 4 and, and Hebrews 7. He's a great high priest who intercedes, who ever lives and pleads to intercede for us, as it says in verse, or chapter 7. He wants to intercede for us. He's there in the throne room of God right now to hear the things that are on our hearts. And God our Father, again, Father, you're not the father. You're the child. No matter how old or young, we're the children of God. Love's giving us what we ask according to his perfect will. Right, Ray? By the, by the will of God. <laughs> according to the will of God. That's right. By his spirit in Christ. And we see that in Matthew 7. We hear the heart of God and it says in Matthew 7, Jesus is talking about the Lord. Who in the world, if you were a, a bad guy... You know, negative, evil, wretched people you are, you know, love to give good gifts. How much more your Father in Heaven loves to give His children good things, things that are good for them. Not maybe the things they always want. My girls want Oreos all the time. I got one of those out yesterday, and my, oh my, I just, animals. <laughs> And I know, I know, it, it would not be, especially if they've been sickly, like, you don't need all this sugar. My goodness. But I love giving them what they need. I love giving them what, what... I love giving them the things that are so beneficial and so good for them. I want to see so much that they succeed. I want them to know that every time they come to me with a request that's according to Dad's will, I guess, if you will, and that, that, that is going to be good for them because I know. But every time they come, I want them to come. I want them to sit at my feet. I want them to know that, that, that there's this process going on, that I'm giving them what's best. And I care for them so much. That's the process of prayer, folks. How much more thankful could you get if you knew the process of prayer? 
I don't think you got. I, I, if we actually took time and we thought, man, this is what's really going on. I don't know if they, have you really stopped. I, until we talked about this a few weeks ago in that study, I've never really stopped to think what really the process of prayer looks like. Man, I have confidence now. I know, I know that the the Spirit has come in the name of Jesus because only He would allow me in the throne room. Only He, in His name, I could come. And, and, and the Spirit's funneling and filtering the strange things I have to say. And it, you know, and and then I, I He's sending that up to Jesus, and Jesus is pleading on my behalf. And the Father's like, man, I just want my best will for that kid. I'm be glad to give it to him. I think the misnomer is that a lot of times we think, oh, you don't need to pray. God knows. You know? Um, I tell you what, if my kids didn't ask me for something, I wouldn't give it to them. Why? Because I don't love them? No. Um, it's not it. It's because I just I, I, I want them to understand and learn and experience and, and see and, and interact with me. I want that. I want that. God's heart is the same for you. So a powerful prayer life, I think, hinges on some of these things. And as we close, I want you to think of a few things. Actually, uh, Oswald Chambers gave this, and this would be a good thing to close on. Prayer is the battle. You're in a battle. Prayer is the battle. It is a matter of indifference where you are. Whichever way God engineers circumstances, the duty is to pray. Never let the thought, oh, I am of no use where I'm at. Because you certainly can be of no use where you are not. I love that. Wherever God has dumped you down in the circumstances, pray. Call on Him all the time. Whatsoever ye ask in my name, I will do. I challenge you with these kind of final thoughts as we close. Do I deal with worry by worshiping before I pray? (laughs) Do I really deal with those anxieties before I pray? Or are my prayers born out of anxiety? I think if we dealt with the anxiety before we prayed, I think we'd have such a neat, clear understanding of what God's will is. We get to commune with Him. We get to worship Him and experience Him. But all too often, we're just worry warts. Could you imagine? I mean, have you ever been? I just, just I don't want to kill this, but I want you to get this. Have you ever been around somebody just worry, 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 and you're like, I don't want to hang out with them. My goodness. I think that's how God is almost. Like, goodness gracious, lay it down. I've got it covered. I want to hang out with you. I think that's what God's saying. That would be a word for somebody today. Don't worry. Just, just worship. Have a good time with the Lord. Do I pray with consistency? Is my life in a position where I'm praying constantly? I hope so. Do I pray in the Word? Boy, if you are not praying in the Word, your, your prayers are not near as powerful as they could be. Pray in the Word with faith. Knowing that God's pouring His Word into your life and you're hearing things and it's just directed to a situation, you can have confidence as you pray by the Word of God. Do I pray thankfully and confidently knowing God's in sovereign control? Do I know the process to where I can say, yeah, God, yes, you've got it. You've got this. Then we can pray thankfully. Boy, I hope your prayer life, just on some of these basic, simple things, don't overlook. I know this passage, you and I have probably read uh, Philippians 4, 6, through seven and even quoted all the time and all that stuff. But God's peace can't really come, folks, unless we really take it to heart what he's saying. And I know it seems like little, maybe little things here that we need to kind of blow up, but in reality, you do these things, man, I, the God of peace. The pastor's all understanding will guard your heart. You'll feel it. You'll understand it. You'll know it, I believe. So I pray you challenge yourself with some of these things. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for your grace and going over time here today. But, Lord, I pray that this would yield more fruit than ever before in these lives. Lord, this is not about me. This is not about them even. This is about you and getting your will done on this earth. Lord, would we be prayers that, that would be confident, that would we would be prayers that are praying in the word? Would we be prayers like Elijah who knew your word? that experienced the supernatural in their life, that experienced answered prayer. 
Lord, would you help us to, to, to be humble enough to do some of these things and experience what answered prayer feels like and looks like? God, it may seem rudimentary, it may seem fundamental, but Lord, help us to really think about the process and get back into a life that's powerful in prayer and full peace. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity even, Jesus, to come and to be in your presence. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for our sins so that we'd have a voice in heaven. God, would we not take that for granted? We thank you and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we final, uh, close with our final worship song this morning. Let's stand together as we final, uh, close with our final worship song this morning. Stand together as we final, uh, close with our final worship song this morning.